Welcome back to Weekend Walkabout in our gardens and yours virtually. We're talking about native and natural ground covers today. We're coming to you from GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Stephen. I'm Janet. And this is going to be chapter one of native and natural ground covers, what they are, why we value them, just a general how to take care of them. That's, that's us too. That's us. And that's Sonia, who's my, our daughter, who's monitoring the chat. She's a great gardener. She's also technically very adept at handling yep. technical problems and, and dealing with these kind of messages. Um, we write about gardening because we've learned a lot about gardening by writing, by answering people's questions, and we feel uh, a great responsibility to hand that information off to other people and get more back. We do. So look for us on our website and look for our news there. We have a very special guest with us today, Cheryl Penerup, who was Cheryl's Gardens here in Michigan when we got started. You can find out more about her um, if you listen to the In Our Garden se session, mm -hmm. if you haven't already. But she is a, a now retired grower, lifetime grower of perennials of all kinds um, in the millions, I'm not exaggerating, literally in the millions. She has retired recently, not only from the gardening business and they sold the nursery, but uh, they've sold this house where they were surrounded mm -hmm. by acres of ground right. cover and perennials. You could walk through um, just like as if you were in a nursery, you could walk through and go, my gosh, look at all, look at those, that's leopard's vein blooming yellow there in the woods and Veronica behind it, of... geraniums and uh, and it just went on and on and on, plants of all kinds. So we figured she is a great person to help us talk to people about, about um, the, the, yeah, the practicalities of growing ground covers. Um, so uh, our website is where our information is and where you can get a hold of us during the week, where you can find uh, on a search things like um, pruning Diane. I think you should put a dwarf blue spruce back there and keep it pruned in that corner you asked us about. Yeah. And uh, keeping it pruned would be go to garden A to Z and in the search field, put in prune spruce and yeah. find things like how to prune, prune this blue spruce to get it back off of the patio. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, it was almost as far out as. And Barb was so brave to let us do that. Yeah, that's a big cut back. Um, there is a outline you can follow today and you probably want to have it sitting someplace where you can look at it because it's got a long list of ground Plants. covers. And yeah. we're going to ask you, which one do you want to hear about? So you want to have found your chat button and your raise your hand button. We're going to start with defining what we call a ground cover. Yeah. It is those plants that grow tightly knit, so tightly knit that they can shade out competition. They block it out. That's what they do. They shade it out in most cases. They're a living mulch. They keep the weeds down. The soil temperature is moderated. The uh, organic renewal with everything falling in, and going underneath there. Yeah, there are places where we used to put down every year uh, 11 yards of mulch, where we now put down three because we've got ground covers covering the ground instead. Yep. And there's technically no height limit on a ground cover. You no, it can, it can be a spreading U that's covering your ground. Yeah, it can be <clears throat> sumac that's 10 feet tall, but popular ground covers are under 12 inches. And for us, they're under 12 inches most of the time. Yep. The native versus natural thing is a big, uh, oh, it's a it's a can of worms to open up right now. Um, if it was here before Europeans came in with their plants, then we generally call it native. Although there are some things that came in here with the Vikings. Thank you very much, all you Viking yeah, yeah. Uh, people. I mean, look at the thistle. The, yeah, that, thistles. That article we thistle is called Canada in. thistle. It's not Canadian. It's Eurasian. It was just it here can... in such numbers ahead of time. Anyway, native. It was here before European colonization. We'll call it native. Um, if it's natural, we those are those things that were introduced and they they managed to live on their own. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that are invasive naturals um, that we yep. try to avoid, but they're all ground covers. That's our native blood root, pretty much a, a agreed by people that that bear paw like looking leaf has been here since before the European people got here. Whereas the Chinese dwarf astilbe, which is also a great ground cover, is not native. Yeah. We will we will talk about the the dwarf astilbe because although it's not native, it does not show a tendency to get out there and exist on its own and muscle muscle out the native guys. Yeah. Why do we use them? Well, it gives you <laughs> unity if if you you have that 
carpet or a bed of of a flowing ground cover you you could unify yeah beds. It, does. It, it makes it just gives that look to the entire view in the landscape um, connecting different buildings to each other it also gives some contrast if you like to just like a framing a picture putting a uh, ground cover with a contrasting foliage texture mm -hmm. or color underneath the shrub helps make the shrub stand out a little bit. Um, if you are thinking of using it as a lawn alternative, remember the foot traffic problem. Yeah. Very would, few ground covers can handle extensive walking on like lawn. Yeah, you can walk on, I walk on our ground covers underneath the crab apple twice a year, but not every day. Like a not lawn. on a regular path. Lawn has got, got the, 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 the block on that there. But unity, so the same sedum appearing across the, the screen makes that big bed that goes in even around the curve at Irene's, makes it, it unifies that area um, and complements shrubs. So these uh, oak leaf hydrangeas, another one that you prune like a crab apple, they can't be pruned real hard and still bloom. But it looks good with that golden satin grass or forest grass with it. It's a different color, it's a different texture, and, uh, and it is, um, complementary and, and balanced in terms of, of mass. There's a mass of so hydrangea and a mass, mass of, of the forest grass. Um, whereas the bigger leaf, here we've got a hydrangea and we've got the bigger leaf of a perennial geranium, it's not quite as much contrast with the hydrangea, contrast with the weeping spruce, but quite, not quite as much. And that's, that's entirely your that's own choice. That's personal choice. That's a subjective, course. how much drama do you want? Real big, contrast between the, the ground cover and the top or not. Sedums are great ground covers for around roses because they, uh, they let the rose still have air. So we got uh, ground cover junipers and sedums around these roses. Those roses need good air circulation. They don't need competition. A lot of ground covers are too tall and they get mm -hmm. into the rose and um, that can be a tough thing for a rose to handle. I'm not advancing. Uh -oh. Um, same old story that we tell in webinar after webinar, so we won't spend too much time with it. They've got to be suited to the site. Right plant, right place. If, if the ground cover is not in the right amount of sun, if it's not in the right soil, it's just not going to grow like the ground cover you want. Some other plant is going to move in and say, I'm the ground cover here. It, or it will be the ground cover that you're constantly weeding, which was why you planted the ground cover so you wouldn't weed. Yeah. Um, so we're going to show you a list uh, when we get into chapter two of plants, and it's going to say full sun or part shade, full shade. When we say full sun, we mean at least six hours a day sun on that space. Cast a shadow sun, not, oh, it's bright out here or it's hot out here. No, six hours where there, it, it can cast its own shadow. And it's also a lot like we talked earlier about our uh, bottle brush buckeye. Some of these are can go in and out, but but yeah. the, to perform the way you are picturing it, yeah, it needs that conditions. The best ground covers can cross the line. So snow in summer is one that comes to mind that it's on our list. Snow in summer is a good gray leafed ground cover. It's low. And it does very well in the sun, but it'll grow into the part shade quite evenly. It'll mm -hmm. still act as a ground cover getting into the shade. So the best ground covers cross the line. The, the worst ground covers are specific. Rampant. Real, oh, rampant. No, rampant. Yeah. yeah, they yeah. go like anywhere regardless. It doesn't matter what. So you're in the part shade and the nine bark will grow there. It will not bloom as well and color as well, but it'll grow there. And it, it, it's in a place where sweet woodruff grows underneath it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, out in the sun, uh, bayberry is growing quite well and sedum grows underneath it, but you'll notice that the sedum does not continue into the shade of the bayberry. The sedum says, no, really, um, that's not my place. Um, in the dense shade, we find ground covers that are, uh, this is big leaf aster. It's native throughout much of north, uh, eastern and northeastern United States mm -hmm. and into the Midwest here. And this is a, uh, a plant that will grow in very deep shade and right up to the, the trunks of trees yep. um, and bloom late in the year. Like most asters, it is something that deer will eat. <laughs> so yes. you have to put up with those kinds of things, but it'll grow there. Um, uh, we grow it with uh, Amsonia as a taller ground cover in that area. Uh, we tried to exclude the ones. <sighs> 
that when we talk about them, we feel they're more trouble than they're we worth. We do the yeah, we do that cross, you know. Yeah. Hutinia, um, uh, creeping buttercup, English ivy, hutinia mm-hmm. needs to be restrained by pavement, and even pavement it can sometimes it it was popping up over there, and and it's fighting out another, it's fighting with another quite uh, aggressive aggressive ground cover, the Japanese bug grass. But which one is winning? Yeah. It, it, it gets people, they bring it home and go, oh, it's so pretty, it has this pink on the leaves and the white on the leaves, but um, no, we don't think it's worth putting that in there. We don't think English ivy is worth it. No, It's a regular thing to take it off of the trees because we don't want it to go all the way up the trees. It's a regular thing to cut that path, to keep the path in there and keep it away from the path. Got to keep it away from the hostas, got to keep it away from no. the wildflowers. It's too much work. We do not think English ivy is worth it. We don't think ostrich fern is worth it. Um, ostrich fern, you can see there, I can see the green in the path. See the nub coming All the way across. Yeah. It goes doot, 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 doot. Yeah. And I'm not into that. We moved into the gar- garden that we're in here. It had been gardened by several gardeners before us. And the backyard was full of ostrich fern. I went, nope. You nope. Um, I don't like that it runs as much as it does. And I don't like that in August every year, it turns brown and falls down if it's dry, which is dry in our garden. I won't put up with that kind of look. So um, I don't like that one. And I won't talk to you about that one, but you might like it. My client client likes it. I said, you know, it's going to eat your primulas. It's going to get in with those primulas and shade over them and they won't grow there. I'll keep them out. Okay. Okay. That's all right. You go right ahead and do that. Um, some of the shrubby things like the ground cover roses and uh, dutzias, and they're just wild things. They, uh, they reach over the top of everything, you know, yeah. root on the far side yeah. and yank it down. Um, so a lot of those things are worked out. And blue lime grass. Oh, blue um, old grass. No, it's blue lime, lime, lime grass. grass. Old lime grass. grass is the old nice grass one. grass is a good one. Lime grass oh. is good for holding dunes in place. I'm but... surprised it's not coming up through the asphalt. Yeah, <laughs> and, but it also looks ragged when it's not. When it, it Steve, really, Steve didn't take a picture this summer of one in August, and we said that is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. There was no way. There was no way to capture any kind of a useful picture out of it. It's so ugly, mm-hmm. um, and some of them just take work. Uh, coral bells are native, and can cover the ground quite nicely. They're almost evergreen, but every few years they have to be divided, and they're very subject to weevil damage. And mm-hmm. I just. That area, that big area, dividing that many plants. And, and ugh. in some of these, you might end up have you might be raking out a little bit, and and all of a sudden the whole plant will come up because of the weevils. Because the weevils are too. And, so anyway, if it's too much work, they can't take care of themselves without me getting in yep. there all the time to divide. Them, I'm not going to do that. How do we grow ground covers? Clean bed. Start with a clean bed. You have to start with the bed clean. Um, so we smothered the lawn there at. Sue's, and we cut out just enough lawn, a circle, to plant the shrubs and let them get started. And it was two years, three years, making sure that we killed everything yep. underneath before we started planting ground covers underneath those shrubs. Um, yep. Make sure it's a clean bed. Now, we waited time in the case of Irene and Jack. Jack just kept going out and killing it with Roundup. Yeah. Um, I, I, think that, I think that causes problems for ground covers that grow by seed. That, that ground the roundup does have a residual that stays in the soil so yeah. if your your ground cover is going to spread by seed that that may not be the way to do it oh sorry, sorry Stephen. um how do you do ground covers you have equal companions the evergreen will win yeah we if it's if it can still be green late into the fall early in the spring it's a plant that's going to win in the long run height wins and fast growers and fast growers win so you're looking for things that have an equal uh energy level equal Equal height height. if you're going to put them together or are very unequal like the shrubs up here at six feet and the ground covers down there at 12 inches Uh, so we look for things that are equal both these wood poppy this might be in cheryl's back acres no mm-hmm. maybe i can't remember this is wood poppy solid uh, also called celadine yep. poppy stylophorum and in front of it is big leaf forget me not or um brunera and those two both spread by seed they are both about 18 inches tall when they're blooming sometimes a little bit taller um, they look good together they grow in the same areas together and so when the stylophorum the wood poppy maybe 
opens up an opening, either one of them can seed into it mm -hmm. and grow and they do pretty well together. So equal companions um, and a clean bed. This is a plumbago. These clumps are plumbago. Ceratostigma plumbaginoides, what a great name, huh? Yeah. And we needed a ground cover that was going to cover the ground out there underneath those sergeant crab apples and the ewes, but not become messy looking by being really big, um, not get out of hand. And so that's a clean bed and ground cover space so that it can fill in. You'll see that one later filled in. This is using um, pulmonaria, Bethlehem sage, which I learned in England as hundreds and thousands. It spreads by seed. The clump gets bigger, but it also spreads by seed. And uh, it's uh, not quite as tall as um, some of the goat spears. There's goat spears in there. Goat spears stay in clump. So I said, okay, you can rattle around at the feet of the goat spear and of the father gilla, which mm -hmm. are gonna grow taller than they do. Um, forest grass, golden sand grass, cannot stand up to Pachysandra. In the long run, and actually in the short run, every single year, that pachysandra is going to have to be cut back. Um, I didn't see much pachysandra at your place, Cheryl, in uh, Berlin. What we had a lovely pachysandra procumbens, and the native uh, pachysandra, native one. It was slow growing, but that was nice. And then in the woodland area, many years ago, Pierre had planted pachysandra. And that was nice because it did what it needed to do, which was to keep down the weeds. Even though it was in the woodland area, it worked real well. As did May apple, although May apple is, you know, went dormant. But uh, the end of the, end of that the was a lovely ground cover for that area and kept the weeds down surprisingly real well. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're all looking for the things that work best for us. And Pachysandra, you have to know, is one of those plants that that um, is a top top quality ground cover, and that it covers the ground and keeps yeah. a lot of other things out. Um, but I don't think you want to walk on it very much at all. It's no. be the kind of thing that uh, is there and just to keep the weeds down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and stay out of this area. Yeah. Look, look, but don't walk through this area or put paths right. in the area if you're going to go through regularly. Um, this is Dave Michener. Dave Michener was on with us uh, last week uh, talking, and this is his his uh, public strip, uh, outlawn hell strip. You can call it all kinds of things that you want to call it. And it starts off with bulbs and then can be covered by things like that plumbago that come up later. But evergreens wouldn't work there. No. Would not work there. Um, you, uh, Ameri um, ginger. Uh, uh, ginger, but what's there that I wanted to point out is the fence. Ground covers at the property line. Um, you're probably going to have trouble keeping a ground cover neat right along the property line unless you can cross the line and work on both sides mm -hmm. because your ground cover is going to try to move further than you gave it uh, leave to move and the neighbor's stuff is going to try to come in. So watch out for those. You, you have to find some way to draw a line for ground covers. Yeah. Um, you want high contrast, I think, between the shrubs and your ground cover and between potential weeds. We nixed using um, bishop's weed, gout weed, we'll talk about that later, at one client's place because next door on the other side of the fence was poison ivy in the cemetery at Helen's mm -hmm. place in Palmer, yes. in Palmer Woods. And that poison ivy leaf and the goutweed leaf looked too much alike. You were gonna end up with getting into the poison ivy. So there should be some high contrast between whatever you don't want to be there or wherever you don't want the ground cover to go over. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're planting a bed, mulch it too. Yeah, um, and mulch it in the fall is the better, it's really the better time to mulch, especially making it simpler for ground cover. Um, Pachysandra and evergreen shrubs, boy, two great combinations for, for uh, covering the ground and keeping it clear for you. Don't even have to mulch that. Maintain it, maintenance. Um, we watched for the, the things in our old yard. In our old yard, we had 15,000 square feet of no lawn. <laughs> and uh, there's no way we could keep up with it, especially as yeah. we got into our last years there and we were dealing more with flood damage regularly than taking care of the garden. So we looked at what made it without us. Barren strawberry. Did just 
fine. Yeah, what a thug. Just like strawberry makes runners on the ground and takes off. But even yet, you can see the buckthorn coming up in there, or I can see the buckthorn. Yeah, oh, yeah. See the buckthorn foliage there? Just below your pointer now, Steve. To this one. Yeah. yeah. So we weed in the fall in ground covers because then the woody weeds, the ones that tend to find a way to get to live in the forest, um, are the ones that stand out. And that's what you want to get out. So once a year anyway, weeding to take the- I mean, you do have to weed. Oh yeah. I mean, you got to watch for the perfect. weeds to come up in there. Um, and if you like that look, uh, the Waldsteinias, um, they they give that same look right. as that which, plant. Yeah, which is, I'm sorry, that's what um, what, what I meant by barren strawberry with the common names. I shouldn't do that. Waldsteinia, yeah, Ternada, Waldsteinia, Ternada. They make a clump. And spread out sideways more so than the the, the runners, right? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, the uh, the weed in this garden is choke cherry, the native choke cherry. You can see them coming up in there, and they stand out. Now this is a new bed just getting started. That's that pulmonaria that I showed you a little bit earlier before it got going, and um, you need to keep those down until your ground cover can cover. And, and those are seedling weeds. There shouldn't be if we did this bed right. There shouldn't be perennial weeds coming yet. Yeah. No, it should not be there. Um, so what you're doing is you're keeping the trees out. See the red bud coming by that weeping hemlock? If you do it once a, once a year in the fall and pay special attention walking through all of that vinca, you'll find those things that have managed yep. to come. The, uh, the good evergreen ground covers and dense thick ground covers will keep the seeds from reaching the ground. Um, uh, woolly thyme keeps seeds from reaching the thyme. It's only from the ground, it's, it's only an inch or two inches yep. thick, but it keeps them from reaching the ground in the first place. Um, and ground covers in ground covers. Um, so the perennial geranium that put itself into the golden satin grass, Steve and I call this, see who wins. Who wins. We go, okay, well, well, let's give it a shot. See who wins in that case. Um, it's kind of fun to do. Don't get too attached to plants. Um, painted fern versus uh, uh, maidenhair fern versus sweet woodruff. I don't know. Versus the poor ginger that's going to be. <laughs> but that's European ginger. I've seen European it's ginger manage to make. Where all these are gone, it keeps it going. Been. So there's a hell of more. So when you mix them up, you can see who wins. Um, do consider renewing them once in a while. This is a uh, um, dwarf astilbe. And every once in a while, it'll get a ground cover bed will need some help. Take out some chunks, mm -hmm. divide them up, and renew it. So the astilbe used to come along quite well all the way up the path and was not doing so well. I said, okay, you, you've been getting too beaten up by other plants. Take a piece of astilbe and it's, that's planted. I don't, I think you can see the little pieces that's been replanted with little pieces of astilbe all through there. And to give you the continuing story of how that works, this is a quilt of ground covers. And at this point, this was 2011. And I think it had been in place, let me see, she's in there 17 years. It had been in place three years. It started with ajuga, sweet woodruff, lamium, and liriope, some mm. one of our favorite combinations. Yeah. But after three years, the ajuga had had a good year, the woodruff had had a good year, the lamium went, mm. see it? There's there. The lamium. The lamium went, ah, can't handle this. And the liriope was kind of getting uh, overrun. But then we put them there to be a carpet, to be an alternate yeah. lawn. Somebody put a piece of a of uh, yarrow over on the side, maybe because it seemed like we needed something over there, and that yarrow began to creep into everything else. See the pink flower there to the left? It's creeping in on the ajuga, and the ajuga is saying, "Well, fine, you want the sun, I'll let you have the sun." But then one year, when things happen, relatives are sick and need help, and that kind of thing, the bittersweet planted itself in there and a piece of morning glory. And we went, ah, mm, ah, bittersweet. But and, don't give up. This is yeah. this is the same place. Don't give up. We dug out the bittersweet and the uh, morning glory and, and realized that the ajuga had been pushed way out to a small space by the, the yarrow. Yarrow is not only a top dog in terms of it's taller than the ajuga, um, but it also is a, uh, an allelopath. It poisons yeah. the ground to other plants and, and discourages their growth. So I cut it back and then said, you know what? We took it all out. We took out the arrow yep. and, and sp spread what was left of the ajuga around in that area. And in a year and a half, 
the Ajuga said, okay, I'm fine again. We also spread the liriope around and we'd lost the all white lamium. We said, okay, fine. You can just come back as the spotted lamium. And we added perennial geranium. Which I think is eventually going to be the right. winner. And this is what it looked like <laughs> last year. Um, yes, that perennial geranium is really moving out. In the space where the arrow was, where it was hot, we're looking for what works well. We've got a dwarf cat mint. Oh, I did it. We have a dwarf cat mint and a dwarf coreopsis. And we're letting them tell us whether or not they'll fill that hot area. That's maintaining a ground cover that's just ground cover and just what we call a quilt of ground covers. And, and that shows you how things can change from year to year to year with the ground cover. That one year, this one looked really good. And, and you give it time and look at the liriope now. It looked like it wasn't even going to survive. Yep, and look at it go. And that's a 10-year prog progress. Okay, so what questions have you got about ground covers in general? And we'll move on to ground covers in specific. Excellent, and we do already have some recommendations lined up for specifics, just to let everyone know that you can keep dropping recommendations in if you wanna hear specific plants talked about. Uh, okay, in terms of the handout, uh, Nancy is curious about why not heuchera uh, under the uh, excluding section. Um, because they're, they, they take too much work to take care of. Now the heuchera, we have heuchera villosa, the straight species in our garden, and it takes care of itself. We have not, and not yet, but then it's only been five years. Yep. I haven't yet had them in, um, infested with weevils. I haven't had them die back terribly, mm -hmm. but most coral bells, you need to divide them on a regular basis to keep them rejuvenated or other things move in around them. And that's not our definition of a good ground cover. We want a ground cover that in that 10 years time, that lamium still, the, the sweet woodruff is still there. The azuga yeah. is still there. They're fighting it out with other plants, but they're each still there and, and vigorous. Coral bells, the, 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 the color of the foliage is almost a star more than a ground cover. They, some of the new ones, they're, they're almost more worthy of a, of a place of a star rather than covering the ground. That, that yeah. the, in a huge mass, they can look good, but when they start to go bad, yeah. it's a lot easier to manage that little star than a whole. And it's area. only been, Cheryl, how long have they been um, it, it, introducing those crosses of the Heuchera um, Americana with Velosa and the Heuchera? I would say about 10 years now. I, I don't know if I would even go as far as 15 years, but they've, they they are good. They they do hold up, but I agree with you. With the Velosa straight is a real stalwart. Mm -hmm. It it really can take a lot of situations, including dry, where again a lot of them need to have a bit more moisture. Yeah, and so since there've been since the the breeders have been crossing the other heucheras with Velosa. We might see some that are coming out more vigorous, but 10 years is not long enough no, to know we which don't. ones. I mean, look, that little bit that we worked with was with existing good cultivars that we knew about, and still over 10 years, they fluctuated back and forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we, yeah they also tend to get that, that burn around the edges, and mm -hmm. sometimes that becomes the whole plant as opposed to uh, just the edges. Um, yeah, they can be pretty temperamental at, in. Yeah. And so, no way can you walk on them. No way. Right. Most ground right. covers like there at the, the Sweet Winter from whatever, I can trample around in them once a year or so, but coral bells, you can really do some yeah. damage walking in there. What else have we got? Yeah. Yeah, another handout cl clarification. RK is saying that uh, on the handout, it says that blood grass is unstable. What do you mean by that? Um, Japanese blood grass in, in its most popular form is called Red Baron. And it's short. I'm saying I'm holding my hands here at, at 15 inches or so. If that. It's, it's short and it's uh, bright red during the spring and in the fall. Um, but its species, um, right now, Imperata cylindrica, its species is, is two and a half feet tall, much more green, and runs like a mother. I mean, it runs like somebody's chasing If you it. think Impero runs fast. Yeah. yeah in Louisiana, it was outlawed. It's got to be going on 20 years ago in Louisiana. We we're not selling any of this stuff. It gets out into the wetlands and takes off. It takes. It's a major uh, problem, Japanese grass, in, in the Smokies now, too. Yeah. 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 So. Yep. 
Uh, all right, and then um, Joyce is looking for any recommendations for ground covers uh, on health strips on a main street. So it's salted in winter. Carol says she's also caring for a church health strip that uh, gets chemicals from keeping the walk clear. Any suggestions there? Um, boy, I, I remember somebody at Ohio State did their uh, doctorate work, was doing their doctorate work on things that could grow in health strips and, and daylilies were one of the ones that could take some of it. So they were using dwarf daylilies. Um, we consider dwarf daylilies kind of boring. <laughs> you think the geranium uh, macrorhizum? Sure, the bigger the the geranium mm -hmm. that you saw us introduce into that strip that we just showed you, it, it is a great plant, and it, and there are some hybrids of the the big root geranium. It's almost evergreen, and they've crossed it with Canabrigiense, maybe, or maybe yeah, Canabrigiense. I I believe yeah. so. And they're a little yeah. bit, a little bit smaller. Yeah. So yeah, try try those. We all at um, at Dave's there at his health strip. Um, we showed it with a lot of blue blooming bulbs in it right then. They use the geranium, um, but he's in the part shade, and they're using the native geranium as a as a ground cover yeah. along with um, Tovara, which we'll show you a little bit later if you'd like to look at that. Um, sedums, Adrian, we have a picture coming up of, of sedums in Adrian's health strip, just a whole combination sedums, of carpet sedums. Sedums seems to be able to handle a lot of conditions. Um, at our, well, I think time maybe. Time, at our old house and at Sonia's new house now, woolly time. You can drive on woolly time. <laughs> oh, the, the snow plow goes right against the curb where our woolly time is and the woolly time just kind of laughs at it. Yeah. Um, but actually, speaking of uh, conditions, Stacy's also curious about a uh, recommendation for an area with young kids, something that can be planted under a play structure where the grass won't survive. Nope, sorry. Nope. No. Yep. Uh, That's <laughs> we need the health strip. Get, mulch, get mulch. the rubber wood. Get, get, yeah. Get, get, no, no just, sorry, not even soil will survive underneath. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry Stacy, but no, that's the whole deal with, with alternate lawns there. A lawn is, uh, I, a lot of money went into breeding lawn to handle what it can I mean, handle. Think about just a soccer, a football game and a soccer game, what they do to the lawn and yet that you go into the stadium the next time and you can't even tell. Yeah. Lawn can handle so much more than any other yeah. ground cover. Yeah. Yeah. And one, let's do one more location thing, and then we'll move on to do some specifics uh, in, the, in the next section. Barb wants to know about suggestions for shade ground cover under pines. I have a circular driveway with a large raised bed in the center with big, very old white pines. Lots of pine needles all the time. Um, people think pine needles are the problem. They're not the problem. Uh, it's, it's dry under there. If, if you were shoveling snow this week, Cheryl, I, I unearthed pictures of Pierre unearthing your cars from that oh. huge snow years ago. <laughs> feet and feet and feet of snow. Um, but if you were shoveling this week and you were underneath the pine like I am, as you get underneath the pine where you were shoveling three inches, now you're shoveling one inch. Um, so it's dry underneath the pine to get. So first thing underneath pines and evergreens is you've got to water to get them established. And then my choice is underneath our pines are uh, um, big leaf forget me not the Brunneras, they're great um, perennial geraniums, Amsonia, uh, Amsonia um, and uh, Golden Star chrysogonum. Yeah. They're all on the list. Cheryl, what would you put underneath white? Pine? I would say chrysogonum, and I know Pierre would add epimediums. Oh yes, oh, yes, yeah. Love, yeah. loves epimediums. Yes. I, I I didn't look at the list to know if that's considered there a ground are. cover, but they're, yeah, they're there. They're, they're there. there. Yes, they're on our list. Um, I, we have them underneath our fur. I was, I, I tend to do that. I picture when somebody asks a question, I picture a garden where that happens, and I'm looking under our pines. And when we're we looking got, under the pine, that under other evergreens that, that <laughs> also make it dry. Yeah, it's it's not just the pine that makes it dry underneath. It's yeah. the big trees with not much moisture getting yeah. down through there. Yeah, but not the needles. I use the needles. Oh um, yeah. I remember one time coming back from Massachusetts and I cut across Ontario to come back and I'm at the border coming back into the US and they got anything to declare it. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, I've got three garbage bags full of pine needles in the back here that I probably should not be taking across here. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody wanted me to clean them up in Massachusetts. I went, ah, oh, I'm not throwing away those pine needles. Those are great mulch. <laughs> I think Incas would also. Um, yeah, yeah. I think would. Incas would, would do real well. I know they did under ours. Yeah, and um, I, I took out all the Vinca. Yeah. I, I used to think that Vinca didn't come much from seed. 
it but, comes from seedling. But I've got seedling that is still coming underneath the pine, so they must do all right over there. Okay, we'll call that the end of chapter one of ground covers, and we'll move on to chapter two of the ground cover choices. Thanks for being with us at GardenAtoZ.org. Hang right on, back. hang on if you're listening to the whole um, recording, because we'll break this up for you.